Um, what's been so great about the papers over the last two days is that while there has been a great deal of technical stuff raised from a variety of disciplines and sub-disciplines, um, we've all been talking to each other from our disciplines and coming back to basics. And people have been avoiding becoming overwhelmingly technical uh, and sort of complacently expert and detailed, uh, which is what you can get. I think it's been a really great tone. We're all talking to each other from different places. And, and so to ramble on about Josephus and how he uses various words in Greek might not be the best way to go today. In any case, I like complaining about my worries. <laughs> so, this is a title I've used before in a draft um, when thinking about uh, the Centre for Textual Studies and this conference. Um, we've all talked about things that bear on texts. We've, we've all been talking about translation in one way or another, hermeneutics, interpretation. A lot of it simply bears on reading and understanding. Um, and I think the discussions over the last two days have thrown up a considerable number of insights and perspectives onto what texts are, what they do, what we use them for. And I doubt those three questions can ever be meaningfully detached from each other. Um, I could very well easily repeat lots and lots of worries and observations uh, about texts in general, but uh, perhaps I'm not qualified to do that anyway. But it struck me in biblical studies, um, we get involved in translation in the sense that we're always using different translations and assessing them, and we get involved in translation in the sense that we go to the Greek or the Hebrew text and we try to produce our own private translations for our own study and exegetical purposes. We're not always real translators. I'm not a real translator because I don't commit fixed translations to the page and then get them published for unknown audiences of unknown size. This is something that Nick bravely does. Um, but it seems to me that there is, not inevitably, but very prevalently, very pervasively in biblical studies, a very historical, critical strand in modern biblical studies. We, uh, we like to ask, what might this text have meant on its own terms, in its own time and place? Which immediately involves us asking, what might the author of this gospel or this letter in the New Testament, for example, what might the author have meant the audience to understand in that first context. This, of course, is not the only question about meaning that you can ask of a text, uh, hermeneutics, um, interpretation. A text will mean something to me even if I don't ask what Paul himself meant. But I spend much of my time asking what Paul himself meant, which is an historical question. So there are particular historical difficulties involved with translating ancient texts, and I started off thinking that I would talk about ancient texts. And then I quickly realized that I'm not just talking about ancient texts. I'm talking about ancient traditional texts. These are transmitted texts, which we've received because somebody wrote them once on a very particular occasion, but subsequently they passed from hand to hand. They became traditional, they've been transmitted over generations, these texts for 2,000 years, and we receive them. And we don't simply receive the text, we, we, we receive them as a canon, and we receive them with this great hermeneutical tradition. And we can't separate those, really. Um, I think when, we're being, when we've got our historical, biblical hats on, and we want to be historians, and we want to say, what did Paul mean? What did the Corinthians understand? We put our historical hat on and we like to tell ourselves that we are discovering the true original meaning of what Paul meant. But it's a worthwhile thing to ask, among all the worthwhile things there are to ask. But we kid ourselves, we deceive ourselves if we think that we can just shed the hermeneutical tradition and get back to what Paul meant. We have to be very, very conscious of what origin and Jerome and Augustine and Luther and others have said about these texts because these voices whisper in our ears all the time when we're reading Paul, for example. Um, and the plain and clear meaning of the text emerges simply naturally in my head 
but it may well be Luther that's telling me that plain and clear meaning, or Augustine, and these people are interpreting each other. So I want to think about what it is to translate a traditional text. I think because it's late in the afternoon and we're all tired, I'm likely to be thinking aloud in front of you for 40 minutes and then we'll see what we have to say on the matter. Haha. Yes. An ancient traditional text. So I asked when I wrote my when I wrote my essay, I asked can a translation ever be a sufficient? Could we ever produce a translation that was perfect such that we can burn all the originals? It's a facetious question, of course. It's just, it came from an anecdote um, when I was an undergraduate. I told uh, a fellow student of dentistry that I was learning to read Greek and very excited about reading the New Testament in Greek. And she said, hasn't it been translated? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I didn't make a very good job of explaining why. I, I think the answer now, I, I, the answer I would give now is I need to read the New Testament in Greek because we don't understand what it means in many cases. That's not to say that we despair of understanding what it means. We, un we think we understand quite a lot of what it means, but there are all sorts of places in the New Testament that we do not understand. So. Any given translation is going to present some sense of understanding what those are. It's going to offer some interpretation of what the text should mean. And so it can't, it can't be sufficient because we still don't really agree on what the text means. We still don't really think we understand it in many cases. So we could never actually verify whether a translation is sufficient or not. Um, that, of course, is a general problem for ancient texts anyway. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, we found lots of texts we'd never seen before. And some of them were fairly complete. We had the problem of translating ancient texts, which is this. You're supposed to bridge a gap somehow. You're supposed to put a foot in both worlds. And if, if we have a modern contemporary text and you get a truly bilingual person or group of people to translate the modern text. They can work on their translation, they can show it to lots of native speakers, and you can get a general sense of whether it's a good, a good translation or not, because enough people know both languages well and both worldviews and contexts well. With ancient texts, there's a general problem that I know my perspective, but I'm trying to reconstruct the first century Medi Roman Mediterranean. Uh, and there are limits to the historical method. We can't be sure whether we've got it right or not. Um, the best we can do is keep reassessing our method. So we can never verify. So one of the problems with translating traditional texts is simply that they're ancient, and there are problems translating ancient texts, because to be the translator of the ancient text, one also has to be an historian. And being an historian is difficult, and we can't test our conclusions very well. Um, another problem is that all the texts we seem to read in the New Testament, at least, are particular. They ooze clues about their original context, uh, particularly Paul's letters. I shouldn't say particularly, I'm sure they all do, but Paul's letters uh, are always in the forefront of my mind. Uh, like a train coming to run me over. <laughs> um, he uses names, he addresses people, he, he refers to <coughs> conversations that he's in the middle of with, with people. He refers to situations, contexts, live disputes. Um, it's often likened to hearing half of a telephone call, although I rather like the idea of taking an American comic book from the 1940s, taking the text out of it and throwing all the pictures away and then trying to imagine what that means. <laughs> Many of the statements could mean a number of things when they lose their context. So it's very particular, Paul's letters are very particular and we do this exercise called mirror reading um, which is inevitable and it's doomed. Uh, it's a kind of an extrapolation. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 
he names a number of items. Uh, there's this problem that Paul names, which is divisions within the community. Um, but commentators can't agree whether the Corinthians see themselves as particularly divided. There's quite a lot of evidence they probably don't, actually. Paul might be uh, rhetorically creating a sense of urgency by telling them that they're dangerously divided. Um, he raises all sorts of issues, lawsuits, struggles between members of the Corinthian community, the, the patronising of temple prostitutes, uh, married couples abstaining from sexual relations as an act of religious devotion, visiting pagan temples, uh, enthusiasm about spiritual gifts and speaking in tongues. All of these things come up like items in a shopping list as though they've been raised in the discussion. But we don't know what the Corinthians' positions are. And we don't know whether the Corinthians have a united position or whether he's really, although he dresses them all at once, whether he's talking to sections of the community that he's addressing. So the fact that we simply do not agree on what much of Paul says in 1 Corinthians, for example, is simply em empirical proof that we have no way of verifying whether we've understood it or not. We try to extrapolate their position out of his letter, but it's a circular process. We're doomed to that circular process. So the particularity of the text is crucial to really understanding that original moment, but because we've only got one part of the conversation, we're doomed to a circular process of trying to discover what that particular situation was. Is it analogous to standing in a bucket and trying to pick yourself up? I think it is. If not, I, I wanted to use the analogy anyway. Uh, three, I suppose I've already touched on, actually. It's difficult to translate traditional texts because they're ancient and history is an imprecise art which can't be tested. It's two, it's difficult because uh, these texts reflect particular situations that we can't recover but we would need to recover the context to fully understand the significance of what is said. Three, because they're transmitted, as I said before, because this transmission of these texts means that we already inherit the text with an understanding of what it ought to mean, because they come with a hermeneutical tradition. So I don't need to labour that point anymore. Um, I may as well have some principal points that I want to at least think about, or perhaps you might have in your minds while I carry on. Um, when I say, what do we mean by text, this isn't the big question. I have a feeling that there are several... In, in, in the literature that I read on ancient texts, I, I've identified four distinct... four very distinct meanings for the, the word T-E-X-T, -E text. Um, they are distinct and it makes a difference, but they're, often, they're always conflated, actually. The, the, and I think it becomes problematic. It becomes sort of... Um, it makes our discussion swampy and uh, it hinders insight, I think, that we conflate these. In particular, there are two meanings that text can have in our common discussions, and they're different. Um, so I'll... I'll go into that. I'm going to illustrate it by looking at handwritten copies from the ancient world, simply because it highlights things. I mean, it might be a, a, a somewhat entertaining little uh, whistle-stop tour through a few, a, a few pictures of manuscripts, um, but it might illustrate the point I would make. I've been using, in my, in my paper, uh, I used a term that I think I coined called encompassing semantic paradigms. I might not have done and it might not be a very good term, but I'm going to use it for now. Um, briefly, I'll give an example of this later, and it will come from Josephus. Um, when an ancient author uses a term like truth or accuracy, uh, we translate it into a term in English that might mean truth or accuracy, and we say, OK, that's a reasonable translation. Cultural differences aside, it'll do. But there are some encompassing semantic paradigms within which those words have meaning, which those words need around them to have meaning, 
which can be very different, and so they can create different, completely different impressions in ancient or modern readers. This isn't necessarily going to be a claim that translation is impossible, therefore. I actually think that a translator shouldn't be held responsible for trying to recreate those paradigms. But it is the historian's worry. Um, I'm going to propose that a text, any given text, both informs and constrains the meaning of its own content. It creates a kind of a kind of a unique semantic matrix, but that unique semantic matrix within itself can only arise within an agreed set of conventions outside of it as well. So there's a relationship between the semantic environment of a text and the one it creates within itself. That's probably not a novel idea, but I think it will be exemplified by one of my examples. <laughs> and the limits of a translator's responsibility uh, is something I want to think about just because I've been inclined in the last couple of years to say translation is impossible. But as the process of thinking about this conference, reading some of the drafts and listening to these papers in the last two days has continued, <coughs> I've started to think maybe what I thought the things that I thought made translation impossible are perhaps not things that are actually intrinsic to translation. They're more generally intrinsic to reading and understanding and communicating, and therefore we shouldn't blame translation for it. So perhaps I can cheer up on the matter. Um, I've just not read the first two pages of my notes, which is a good sign, really, because I wasn't very pleased with them. <laughs> I've, I've proposed this. I think I proposed it somewhere in my draft that I sent around as well. Um, this isn't an attempt to define a text, but it's an attempt to put my finger on some important things that I think texts do. Uh, particularly ancient texts. So whatever a, t a text, whatever else a text might be, I also think it might be a written composition that has meaning within a community of context. I can't see how that could be controversial. The written is sometimes questioned because some people want to claim that um, texts are many things, including oral, uh, pictorial, architectural. Uh, I'm inclined to, to, to follow Marta on this and think that maybe by definition it's worthwhile sticking to uh, our common sense notion that text is written. Did you say at one point it was written? At one point it was written, although it lives uh, beyond its writtenness. Although I do want to point out shortly that writtenness post-printing press has a very different significance than writtenness pre-printing press. Uh, so that should be borne in mind. Uh, writtenness is, does not have the same potency and significance throughout the last 3,000 years. Uh, it is a linguistic composition, organized according to conventions, which invokes a complex of mutually informed and mutually constrained ideas. Um, the, the linguists and the philosophers among us may pick that apart, it's my best effort to put my finger on something that texts do that I think is important at the moment. Okay, so I keep going backwards. So, printing press. Why did I say that? Um, the printing press did something really important. Um, before the printing press, all copies differed from each other. I think you can just say it, even if it's tiny mistakes but in many cases far greater than tiny mistakes, completely divergent versions of the same work or the same text. Uh, and I think ancient people before the printing press were completely familiar with and comfortable with the fact that we know the text, we can give it a name, but any given copy is going to differ from the others. After the printing press, suddenly you can have an unlimited number of identical copies. So the text, Matthew's Gospel, or Lolita, whatever text you're naming, is identical with the 
text marked on the page. This was not the case before the printing press. Also, since, since the printing press, a publication has involved producing a text which is for the consumption of an unknown audience of unknown size and unknown opinions and unknown values. You work on the text till you let it go and then you give it to everyone and you lose control over it. But that is the object of publication. That's actually what you're trying to do. Different in the Roman world. So it's a public affair. And also literacy is common. Um, literacy is common now. Um, we think literately. We communicate textually. We communicate literately now. We don't live in an oral uh, ethos in the way that people did 2,000 years ago in the Mediterranean. And that does make a big difference. I hope I can exemplify that as I go along. Whereas in manuscript environments, that is, in environments before the printing press where people wrote by hand, first of all, a professional would have to write by hand, or at least uh, somebody of the elite who was highly educated. I'm thinking particularly of the Roman world. I suppose in the medieval world we get um, uh, holy orders, um, monks uh, and nuns who are trained in literacy. But in the Roman world, it's quite a special uh, skill. The text of all copies varies, sometimes more, sometimes less, but inevitably so. You get divergent versions of the same text or work uh, in circulation, but people are still happy to refer to it as that. In the Roman world, you write, well, in the main, you write for a small group of people that you know, not an anom anonymous audience. You, you write for your patron, and you please your patron and friends. And the, t the process has more to do with public, semi-private performances among these, this group of people. So you're writing for them specifically, with them in mind, their tastes in mind, their values and interests in mind. Uh, you have your slave read out these uh, editions, these, these various drafts of your, of your composition. Um, I'm thinking of Josephus now, but and people like Cicero and Pliny and Plutarch seem to have worked in the same way. Uh, drawing on work by people like Salas and Garnsey. Um, your, your, your friends and patrons then applaud you and, and, and uh, give you feedback. And on the basis of that feedback, you go away and write another draft and give that to them. Um, at the moment you finally finish the text and then deposit it into some archive or library, you've let go of the process at the end of the process. You've, you've ended the process of that interaction, that literary interaction between them. It's an oral interaction between you and your friends where the text is serving a wider oral role. The text is out of your control now and it sort of sits in an archive and in fact people like Josephus and Cicero and Pliny didn't expect us to still have them now. They weren't writing for us. So it's almost the opposite process. Um, writing and performing your text for your friends and patrons in the ancient world is a semi-private social interaction of performance. And once that's over, you've pretty much uh, lost interest in the, 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 the process of performance is over. Whereas in the modern world, when you publish a text, that's the point where it goes out and that's what you're aiming for. Um, I thought I'd just show you some pictures of texts. This is the most complete uh, copy of Isaiah. I think it's, I think it's around 100, 100 BC, is that right? Paleographically speaking. So it's over a thousand years older than our earliest copy of Isaiah before, that we had before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1949. Um, and it's not a bad uh, replication of Isaiah. I mean, well, it's the oldest one we've got, but it's consonantally, the consonants there are pretty close to the uh, early medieval forms that we had prior to 1949. But there's all sorts of little differences. 
there are three scribal hands on it. They've been correcting each other, adding insert insertions, crossing things out. There are other copies of Isaiah from Qumran which have variant readings. And this is just standard. So really, I'm just showing you pictures of texts. This is one page. Uh, somebody's gathered uh, three passages from the Pentateuch and another passage from a, a Joshua Apocryphon that was in use at the time. Um, but all of these manuscript copies of New Testament texts that we know, or, or Isaiah that I was showing you, they have they exhibit variant versions from all of the others, and that's just a fact of life in the ancient world. Christians start writing in code codices with pages written front and back. Um, helps them transport their scriptures around. So if I take a convention text in red, we often mean by text the composition, the work, Lolita, Mansfield Park, Matthew's Gospel, the book of Isaiah. That's the text. And we often talk in translation, is it faithful to the text? Has it, has it transmitted the text from one language to another? It, it's an abstract literary concept. It's the text which we can call Matthew's Gospel. Um, but when we, we also use exactly the same word, text, which I can put in blue in italics, which stands for the, the unique linear ordered set of signs on the page on the surface of any given copy. Um, after the printing press, there's no difference between the two. So it doesn't really strike us that we're saying at least two things with the word text. But they're completely different in the ancient world. Um, the copy is a manifestation of the work. And the work is an abstract literary object, which is manifest in every given copy. Um, though I think I'm just laboring the point here. The, the text marking, oh, I don't mean marking, the text marked on every ancient copy of a text differs from the text on every other copy. Uh, Book of Jeremiah is a good example. Um, up until 1949, we had the early medieval Hebrew copies of Jeremiah transmitted by the rabbis in rabbinic Judaism. That's the standard Hebrew text that we all find in our Old Testaments now. And then we also had the Greek translation of it, transmitted through early Christians. I mean, it's, it's a Jewish-Greek translation from before Christians, but it's the one that Christians transmit to us. Um, the rabbinic Hebrew version of Jeremiah and the Greek Jewish ancient translation of Jeremiah, which we get through Christian transmission, were really very different versions. You get minor variant readings everywhere. Um, you get blocks of material in completely different orders. And you get, which is the longer one? Do you remember? The Hebrew version. Yeah was substantially longer, wasn't it? I mean, there's large amount, large amounts of it. About a third, yeah. Large amounts in the Hebrew version that simply weren't present in the Greek version. People had all sorts of ideas about this, um, you know, is, which, which derives from which and how they're related and when they diverged in the transmission. Um, and then all of a sudden, when the Dead Sea Scrolls are found in 1949 to 55 or so, and they pull all the fragments out of cave four, you find six copies of Jeremiah, I think, all in Hebrew, most of which conform to the medieval Hebrew copies that we, know, we, we already knew. But then Jeremiah, 4Q Jeremiah B, also in Hebrew, had a text. It's quite fragmentary, but it seems to represent the Hebrew text that this, the Greek version came from. Um, it might not be quite that simple. There might be, might be all sorts of divergences going on, but these are snapshots. So you've got a group of people who had six copy of, copies of Isaiah who put it in a cave when they got into trouble in about 70 CE, and they were quite happy with these very different versions of Isaiah. Same with the book of Daniel, same with the books of Kings and Chronicles. You get very different versions circulating together. Um, 
in the New Testament or pri just prior to the New Testament period. So to what extent is it the same text? You can definitely call them both Jeremiah. That is, they're the same sort of sets of traditional material. But it's not the same text, not in blue with italics. It's vastly different. Um, I'm not, I mustn't labour this point anymore because I don't quite know what to do with it. Um, but it does raise the question of what is being transferred in translation. Are you translating the text there in red or the text in blue? Well, I suppose it's obvious that the text in blue is, is completely changed, isn't it? You change it into a different language. So, presumably you are trying to transmit the text in red. Uh, maybe it would help us if we stop using the same, <laughs> the same word for each, but I don't know how to su what to suggest. <laughs> okay, that's, that's enough, I think I got. Actually, I got a bit carried away, I'm gonna skip all that. What this does tell us, though, is when we apply text to ancient compositions, if I'm interested in what Paul wrote, I actually don't have access to the text that Paul wrote. That's the problem for a historian. I've got something that's been transmitted. And we do hope that the textual critics do their job well and retrieve the closest thing we can get to what Paul wrote uh, by applying text-critical criteria to every single variant reading in all of the available ancient copies. But we can never verify whether they've got it right or not in every case. So I don't have the text Paul wrote, actually. Um, Okay, I just went on about that for far too long. It's probably because I was tired. Although my slides seem to suggest that I've been tired for a lot longer than today. <laughs> um, I wanted to give you just a little example, just because sometimes it's fun to see it happening. Um, can you just pass them around? Um, Isaiah 25, 8, it's a pretty standard example um, because Paul quotes it. Um, Paul usually quotes the Jewish scriptures in more or less the form we know from, well, let's not say Jewish scriptures. He didn't have a canon. Let's stick to Isaiah. He normally quotes Isaiah in the form that we know from the later Septuagint of Isaiah, from the Christian tradition. But every once in a while, he pops out and quotes something that looks like one of the Hebraizing revisions of the Septuagint uh, circulating in that period. Generally something like Theodotion. So the Hebrew, all the Hebrew versions that I'm aware of, including from Qumran, uh, at Isaiah 25, 8, say, God has swallowed up death in victory. That's pretty cheering. The Septuagint, however, says death has swallowed up strongly, swallowed people up. Um, how, do you, how do you know what the Quran says? Well, I, one Quran is I, I, well, you, because you can visualize it. Uh, I, I will, yes, yeah. So the consonantal text of all of the Hebrew versions that we know uh, match the Masoretic text, the later Masoretic text. I'll keep going backwards. Oh dear. <laughs> Don't have the font. There is a word. <laughs> um, what Jim rightly points out is that you've got the key word, the key uh, semantic unit here is. Bet Lamed Aleph in the medieval tradition pointed Billah. Uh, he has swallowed up. That, that would, hmm? I, ayin. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's just not a very good ayin. Bet Lamed Ayin. Billah. He has swallowed up. That would be a reasonable translation of it, I think. Certainly the old Greek translators think so. Uh, but in all of that, that's, that's from 1000 CE um, in, 
to, to our certain knowledge, perhaps earlier, but the, the Qumran copy from, uh, from about 100 BC. Uh, in the, in the New Testament period, they weren't pointing things. They weren't putting vowels in and vocalization. So all you see in the, in the really ancient copies is, is the consonants. So you could either read it as billah or bulla. He has been swallowed up. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly standard example. Um, When you read 1Q Isaiah A from the, early, from the late 2nd century BCE, which corresponds in consonants to the later Masoretic text, you haven't got any of these pointings, these vowels, these vocalizations. So you have a choice, actually, uh, as, as you rightly point out, Jim. The ancient Hebrew versions say either God has swallowed up death or death has swallowed up someone. And when you read it, you have to choose. Uh, they may well have been a tradition to tell you what you should read. It may have been traditional what, what you should read. But the Septuagint translator, who certainly knew Hebrew, decided to translate it. Well, in the Septuagint, we get death has swallowed men up strongly. Uh, in the Hebrew, we get, he has swallowed up death in victory. God has swallowed up death. But when we get down to another version, uh, lower down the page, we get the Theodosian version, which uses the passive here. So it's, as Theodosian seems to have assumed it was bulla, death has been swallowed up in victory. You've got various ways of expressing this in these various versions set out on this page. But all in all, the Septuagint has death swallowing up and all of the other versions in their various ways have death being swallowed up. Um, so a variant reading can make quite a difference. Uh, and in fact, it isn't a variant reading. In the Hebrew, you simply have the choice about which one it means. The Septuagint translator has had to make a choice and fix it. Uh, when Paul came to quote this verse from Isaiah, even though he usually liked the Septuagint, for some reason he decided to quote another Greek version that had the opposite meaning to the Septuagint. Um, yeah, that would have made it all more visually clear. Um, I suppose that's just an example of how copies differ from each other. And in fact, it's an example of how Hebrew often contains this polysemy, which is just there when you read ancient Hebrew uh, and Greek. Uh, anyone wanting to translate it into Greek is going to have to make a decision. There's a moment, I think it's in Hosea, I can't remember where it is, where there's another moment where the, uh, a Hebrew word can mean one thing or another, depending on how you point it. And the Greek translator has just sort of duplicated both options and transported them both into the into the translation, which again you could say is a translation. Um, so that brought me to this idea that uh, a translation, a translator has to make decisions, and to what extent is the translator responsible? Um, does, does a translator have to bring the modern audience closer to the world of the text? Um, or are those, uh, Jim has addressed this more subtly <laughs> than I will, but um, is this doing all the reading for the reader, taking the responsibility, this domestication? So an example I wanted to take of a, an encompassing semantic paradigm, which one might say is the translator's responsibility. If, you're, if your modern audience is supposed to respond like the ancient audience responded, if the translator's responsibility is to produce the same kind of response, then I would say that the translator is going to have to somehow initiate the modern reader into the, the, the semantic, the encompassing semantic paradigms of the or, original readers. So this example from Josephus, um, 
The Roman world seems to be very deeply structured by patron and client relations. Everyone has a patron and everyone has clients. And only the most destitute people have nobody as a client and that's precisely why they're destitute. They haven't got a, they have, they haven't got a patron. If, you're, if you haven't got a patron, you've kind of dropped through the net. Um, even the emperor has big patrons, really, called gods. Uh, and it's the responsibility of a patron to give comfort and safety and support uh, material benefits to clients. And it is the responsibility of the clients to publicly honour patrons, and this seems to be the transaction, broadly, that goes on in patron-client relationships. So somebody like Josephus is going to be writing for patrons. In fact, he talks about his patrons, and he also talks about his literary friends who are interested in reading this work that he's producing for them. So like a Hellenistic historian, like any Hellenistic historian, Josephus makes claims to the truth and accuracy and reliability of what he writes. He, he repeats this a number of times. Um, and it, these are tropes in Hellenistic history. All Hellenistic historians will claim to be the most truthful and the most accurate because they're the most reliable. And they've talked to all the right witnesses, read all the right sources, and Josephus can even claim to have seen some of the things himself. Now, when modern people, uh, after the Enlightenment, read claims like truth, accuracy, and reliability, I think we quite naturally and habitually start thinking in terms of reason, rigorous research, testing. These, these quite sort of scientific and methodical, rigorous notions appear for us. But that's not what would have sprung to most of Josephus' readers' minds. Uh, claims to truth, accuracy, and reliability are claims to authority based on social status. Uh, proved by the honourability of your patrons and your friends. If your patrons are important and your friends are important, they have high status, they are authorities. They, uh, truth and reliability are mediated through this social standing. Uh, and so Josephus can claim this on the basis of his friends and his, and his patrons in high places. So the opposition of truth for Josephus is not falsehood, but bias. He's claiming impartiality. Um, now, many, we could take issue with that and say he was just as partial as any, any other Hellenistic historian, and, and indeed he was. But uh, the claim to impartiality, which is also a trope among Hellenistic historians, is uh, the author knows that the audience will assume that any writer will be writing for the patron and hoping to flatter the patron. So a claim to impartiality is so standard because you're saying, I am in fact so honest that I will not flatter my patrons. I will still write the truth regardless of uh, the consequences. So this whole truth discourse isn't one of reason uh, and rationality and testing as it would be for us. So, um, So we read modern translations of Josephus, we read uh, these claims to truthfulness and accuracy, and I think we would, unreflectedly, it would invoke ideas of, of, of reason and rationality for us, whereas they wouldn't, they wouldn't be driving, uh, driving the content of what he's saying. But how far is the translator really responsible to turn a modern reader into an ancient Roman? I, I don't think that we can say that translation fails just because a translator can't transport a modern reader into some other frame of thinking. So uh, the response of the reader, to some extent, has got to be outside of the translator's control. Wouldn't you agree? Um, I wanted to take some examples now from Paul's language. Am I all right for time? I don't really know when I started. Has it been about half an hour? Uh, Paul uses lots of dikai roots, the righteousness or justification language. Uh, 
our translations often translate justified by faith or justification by faith. Dikaiusthai ek pisteo. So he uses this uh, passive, uh, this passive of the verb, dikaio, to be justified uh, by faith. He also uses uh, the noun dikaiusthane, uh, righteousness. He attributes it to God. He talks of the righteousness of God, which is somehow extended gracefully to, to humans. Um, he talks about righteousness being credited to believers. Uh, righteousness can be credited to Abraham, puts him in a right standing with God. Uh, righteousness credited to believers that puts them in a right standing with God whereby they can be saved. But in many translations, many of our standard translations, the, the dikai cod cognates in Greek uh, are destroyed. Justification is a French root. Uh, righteousness is a Saxon or a Germanic root. And we perceive no, no linguistic link between righteousness and justification. We can see that they might be linked in his text when he talks about justification and righteousness. But we've lost the linguistic connection between those two words. Uh, the same thing, similar thing happens with his pist roots. Uh, pistuenes Christon, to believe in Christ, a uh, very common thing. Um, the believer must believe in Christ to have a sort of a fidelity to Christ. So it's faithfulness towards Christ, but it's also, it is also an act of believing. Um, we end up then with this term, faith in Christ, a very standard term. Uh, in Christian theology. One must have faith in Christ. Faith in Christ leads to salvation. I can't actually find the, the term faith in Christ in, in, the, in the Greek of the New Testament. I might be wrong, but all I can find is faith of Christ. And this, is, this, is a, this has become a debate in, in the last sort of 20 odd years. Um, typically, this construction Pistis Christu, faith of Christ, it turns up particularly in Romans 3, Galatians 3, and Philippians 3. And once faith, the faith of his son, the faith of God's son, turns up in Galatians 3 as well. It's very often translated faith in Christ anyway, because the translators are saying, well, this genitive construction, Pistis Christu, faith of Christ, what it must mean is the faith that people have with respect to Christ in order to be saved. So it's still talking about this believing in Christ, as in Paul's term, pistuen eis Christon, believing in Christ, faith in Christ. But uh, a number of commentators have been arguing very vigorously to resurrect actually the King James translation, faith of Christ, meaning Christ's faithfulness. Um, all of a sudden, in these very, very theologically potent and dense passages, these key theological passages of Paul. Christ's faithfulness to God's saving plan suddenly comes into play. And rather than this rather stark refor reformation dichotomy between uh, trying, to say, trying to achieve salvation through doing works of the law or through having faith in Christ. The, the, the reformer theology will always insist that Paul is rejecting works of uh, law observance as a means to salvation and faith in Christ being the only means to salvation. That really sets up two human responses, the wrong one and the right one. Faith in Christ is right, works of the law are wrong. But if we translate Pistis Christu as faith of Christ, all of a sudden there's a much more complex matrix going on. People do have to have faith in Christ, but also Christ's faithfulness to God's plan is playing a role here. And in fact, it seems entirely reasonable to include in this translation the faithfulness of God, which pertains to what he has done in Christ, because Paul's genitive constructions are so dense, uh, and he puts so much in them, that that may very well be part of what Paul means there. So perhaps we should say we better translate faith of Christ and leave it to the modern reader to interpret whether that means the believer's faith in Christ or Christ's faithfulness or even God's faithfulness through Christ. But I can't see a translation of that construction 
that remains neutral and allows the modern English reader either option. Faith in Christ definitely means the believer's faith in Christ and it completely eradicates the idea of Christ's faithfulness from the equation. Faith of Christ most naturally means to an English speaker Christ's faith. It's, poss- it's, it's quite probable that Paul is working with both because he works with rel- relationships. Um, you know, these patron and client relationships do require fidelity in both directions. A good patron should be faithful to the patronal relationships to the client, and the client should be faithful in client relationships to the patron. And gods are patrons and worshippers are clients in the ancient world. And this is really no different for the Jewish God and for the Christian God in that context, I would argue. So for Paul, pistis and dikaiosune are patron-client language. There's just a little table from Sanders. It's quite, uh, quite common. It shows how we have a noun for righteousness, and an adjective, but we don't have a verb. Sanders ended up coining the verb too righteous <laughs> so that we can express uh, linguistically in a translation things in a, in a similar way to the Greek. We have justify, but people worry about justify because it seems to invoke um, uh, forensic and courtroom implications that are are undesirable theologically to some people. Similar thing happens with belief. We've got to believe, believing and belief, now an adjective verb, but we haven't got a verb to faith, and to have faith in doesn't seem to quite capture the, the same force. So it is quite difficult to find terms that we should use. Sanders just, uh, Sanders solves it by coining to righteous and coining to faith. And he says, because Paul is doing slightly odd things with the Greek anyway, we may as well coin something slightly odd to capture that innovation that's going on. We don't need to know that. That's just me pontificating. <laughs> in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the draft that I wrote, I spent several pages worrying about how to translate psuchikos anthropos in 1 Corinthians 2. Um, I mean, it's just such an old problem. It's really knotty. Maybe, maybe John would have some suggestions. Maybe Jim or maybe others, have, uh, Nick, have thought about this before. I find it really, really difficult. I think this, I'm not trying to say that uh, because I've found a case that I can't translate, therefore translation is sometimes impossible. I suppose I'm just bearing my soul and saying, I don't know what to do about it. Um, if we only had 1 Corinthians 2, this rather peculiar use of psuchikos in the phrase, phrase psuchikos anthropos would be all right. We could think of something, because in 1, in 1 Corinthians 1 to 4, Paul has just set up this dichotomy between a perishing world and a divine sphere. And if you belong to the perishing world, you are in a pretty nasty state and things are not going to go well for you. If you're in the divine sphere of protection, then you're going to be okay. And he seems to be trying to say to the Corinthians, your divisive behavior is placing you into the perishing world, whereas we, united apostles, are within this divine sphere of protection, so your divisive behavior is placing you actually outside of of, of, of the hope of salvation at the moment, so you'd better pull yourselves together. And he presents the united apostles as a sort of a model for their imitation. Pull yourselves together, unite under us. By the time you get to the end of chapter 4, it's unite under me, Paul. And uh, and so he he invokes all of this intellectual language of wisdom. The wisdom of the world is doomed, but the wisdom of God leads to salvation. But you, you can only participate in it. It's got nothing to do with your own intellectual... Uh, human capacities. The sp- if, if you are saved and in, in this divine sphere of protection, the spirit will tutor you as to the will of God. So he sets up a dichotomy between pneumaticos, a spiritual one, 
He, Paul, is a spiritual one. Apollos is a spiritual one. The Corinthians are not yet. He's leaving the door open for them to come back in, but only if they conform to his uh, uh, authority. So, pneumaticos is what all the Corinthians want to be. We can tell they want to be spiritual ones because they're fighting about who's the most spiritual when they babble in tongues that worship. We read about this later in 1 Corinthians. But he, he opposes spiritual one with this strange term, psuchikos anthropos. Psuchikos is an adjective coming from suke, Soul, mind, um, person, life sometimes. Suke is often the animate part that leaves the corpse at death. Um, it doesn't really seem to survive after death. But it's also the locus of reason and mind. Suke is the place where nous and uh, reasoning live. So is it a rational person? I'd be happy to translate it rational person in 1 Corinthians 2 and leave it at that. Only then Paul does something really weird with the same adjective, sukikon, when he gets to 1 Corinthians 15. And the resonances between these two passages, rhetorically, are so strong that you need to make them speak to each other. You need so he talks about a soma pneumaticon in 1 Corinthians 15. It's a spiritual body. That's okay. Um, Paul seems to have thought of spirit as a discrete substance, like Stoics and others of his time. But what's a... What's a soma psuchikon? A soul body? A rational body? A breath body? And how are we to relate it to the quotation from Genesis 2-7, living being, God breathed into the Adam and made him a living being. A suke zosa, a living soul, a living being. But there's nothing to do with rationality there, really. Whereas Paul has been forcing suke... Well, Paul has been using suke and sukikos... Um, just come into my mind just looking at that is the Greek philosophical idea of the tripartite soul. Mm. So you get the highest bit. Then the zone, the animal bit, is the bottom of the bit. Mm. And you get the lively, uh, I've forgotten what the, the term would be, uh, in between. So it's almost as though he's stopped you. The, the, um, the emotions? That, but the that's just. The well, it's not it's interesting. It's natural. Well, it's actually, uh, Suke Suke seems to have um, various kinds of emotions and thoughts and reason going on within it, but I don't think any group of Greeks associate reasoning and feeling and thinking with the soul, do they? You, you'd be the person to answer this, I think, <laughs> or Nick. <laughs> This is a this is a long standing problem. It's, it's a yeah, it's a whole substance. Well, the standard translations have unspiritual for Sukikos, but that's not what's <coughs> being written. Yeah. Some have natural, which might which implies physikos, but that hasn't been written no, either. It's the, it's the yeah. So this is Sukikos Anthropos in one Corinthians two. Then when we get to Soma Sukikon in fifteen you get you often get the physical body, the natural body, you even get the earthly body, referring to the man of dust quotation. You don't get hung up on short sense or phrases in the description. Well, yes, except that I don't see, I just can't find a way to make the two passages hang together. And I think the reason I can't is because he's doing something rather odd with the term sukikos. I think he's He's using it a ambiguously and b well, he's forcing it. Just say that. He's got a neologism. Well, so it's a mistake, and we don't know. Or it's a great bit of rhetoric, it's and it nice worked. Thing. And it worked really well. So I, I've, I've just corrupted. I'm still so racking my brains over it, and I just don't know. Don't, don't yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've probably gone over time already. And we have about ten minutes left for discussion. Okay. Any any comments or thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, many. And thank you very much, uh, by the way. For, uh, <laughs>
I for giving me a lot of things to think about, and all your the other questions you raise raise a lot of philosophical questions. Now I appreciate you've got a headache, I and philosophers are notorious for making that worse. <laughs> That's a warning. <laughs> and um, I would like to deconstruct some of the perfectionism that seems mm. everywhere in your talk. Mm. You start the first slide after your title slide is can any translation ever be sufficient? Yeah. And then an answer is no for various reasons. Sufficient for what? Yeah. I think that without the for what, that question has barely meaning. Secondly, well you then go on, you you answer that uh, the question is sufficient for what? You say, well, we don't understand what the text actually means. But then that raises again a couple of questions. Firstly, um, are you hoping that the translation solves that? And is it part of the insufficiency of the translation if it does not solve that? If it, is a translation supposed expected to lay bare the meaning? Like, as if, I think if your brother writes you a letter, well, you can't get any closer in cultural, temporal, linguistic uh, distance, that's not an ancient text and so on. I think there's always a degree of vagueness in any text. Mm. And I think if we just stop seeing that as a problem, then there you go, that's solved then. And then there's, I think that's... So if, if there's vagueness in a, in a source text, it surely isn't a matter of insufficiency mm. of a translation if that vagueness is preserved in the translation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And secondly, that relates to uh, your, your example of the um, Tsukikos Anthropos and the uh, Soma Tsukikon. Um, if you take a text, and you take text and text varies means one is the stuff, the stuff of which a text, a work, is made, and that stuff can change over time. Again, words can be uh, edited and so on, but the work may be an overarching thing. And also, that need not be a problem. There are many words in English that don't have a clear cut definition, and we can still mm -hmm. use them without a problem. So, um, anyway, so if, if you assume, which I would assume, that the text is more than the some of its parts, so more than the sum of the meanings of the, of the words in it and words and phrases in it. Rather, the other way around, the words and phrases in a text derive their meaning from the text as a totality. In fact, I've heard someone say that words don't have meanings. Yes, <laughs> indeed, for that reason. And then you have the problem of the Soma Sufikon and Soma Pumaticon and the Sufikos uh, Antwas. And this is, of course, very difficult to translate. And I think every translator, every person who's done translation for a job sometime, have grappled with these problems every day. And I think they're real problems. However, I don't think translations fail because they are, or are insufficient, to use your phrase, because there are such problems. I think these that you've listed, you say you, you haven't been able to translate this phrase. I think you're doing a better job than most because you've more than one translation, there you go. I think they're all good translations. The None reason, of them is perfect in a certain sense. The reason I'd be willing to offer rational body, soul body, or breath body is just because I think Paul's doing something really odd and surprising with the language, so maybe our translation ought to be a bit odd. That, um, yeah, that's one concern, and that might conflict with other concerns. But to, it, to, to put in unspiritual, as many standard translations do, or physical, or natural, I actually think it, all of them are fairly disastrous because... For what purpose? Again? They, they set up dichotomies that Paul isn't interested in in, in that yeah. particular passage. He's, he's not interested in a dichotomy between physical and somehow disembodied. But is a, is a translation of a phrase or of a phrase in the Bible, like that? Insufficient. If, mm. if you lose false vagueness, I think. I, 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 my short, a short, a short answer to all of those questions is yes. I, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the rhetorical implications of your questions, um, I think each of these translations preserves a particular feature and loses another feature, mm. and for various purposes of the translation, you might choose one over the other. But 
There are none, neither of them is better or worse outside of any context. The context will determine whether you choose natural body or physical body, or whatever. I, I suppose that's why I asked about sufficiency, because when I, when I asked about sufficiency, I was thinking about this question that comes sometimes, well, hasn't it already been translated? It's been done. But what? this is your answer. So, so, so that question sure. implies that people <laughs> think that there is sufficiency. Well, but what you want done is an annotated text. Yeah, because, an annotated. Because I, you agree with Martha, mm -hmm. but you also have a problem with uh, lots of these. I would just well, say it's the problem. You're done. The only way, surely, to maintain for the reader a knowledge that you've chosen something, but there is there are these ambiguities, is to give them some form of annotation. Which doesn't quite correspond to my usual idea of translation, but that's okay, I suppose. I mean, I, first of all, asking, ask, implying perfectionism, I did intentionally, because I, 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 uh, I've detected that perfectionism in what people say about translation. It should be one. And I don't think we should think be expecting it. Yeah. I don't think we should be expecting it. Yeah. 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 Martin and Sean might have questions. Yeah. Sorry. Since Martin has pressed you at length on one of the things I was interested in asking, I'll ask you that again. Uh, what I would like to do, though, is to pick up another theme which has run quite visibly and not even under the surface mm -hmm. in a lot of what we've been doing in the past few days, which is how much of a special case yeah. ought the New Testament, in this case, to be? Mm -hmm. Because if we find this kind of difficulty in a lot of ancient texts, we often say either the text is corrupt, we don't know what it says, think of a key, a key bit of Aristotle, if you want to know what Aristotle thinks about soul and body, the key bit of Aristotle is corrupt, yeah. you don't know, you can't find it, no one can. Or you say the author made a mistake. Why can't we say either of those things when we have to deal with the New Testament text? Is it a special case? It seems to be a bit special because it comes with this great hermeneutical heritage. It should seems be. to do something to us. I don't know that it should be. Um, I mean, I'm partly able to ask that. I mean, for, a for, a, for a start, like when we, when, when, we get into, when we get into words that we want to translate the soul and spirit into, We've got uh, a very powerful and dynamic Christian heritage, which has very powerfully informed precisely what those terms mean for us. Now, I mean, soul. Soul means partly the part of a human that can be saved, as far as I can tell. Uh, but only in the Christian heritage. <laughs> really? Yeah. But it's, I don't know. It seems to be the bit that gets. I smile all around me. <laughs> yeah. It's the opposite of someone. It's, it's the opposite. In Aristotle, Sukikos is opposed to somaticos. But, but it might be physical, nevertheless. At least some, some authors seem to treat it as a subtle substance. Um, Philo can say that the suke is made of pneuma. So spirit makes, spirits as subs a subtle substance that makes sort of mental um, things. Yeah, um, I don't think, I don't know, I don't know whether it should be a special <laughs> I really don't. But it is one. That's your patron client thing though again. The editors of The Voice, for example, it doesn't matter what the scholars came up with, I mean, I suppose it does, but whatever they came up with, there were some things that the editors had decided, and if you read the introduction to the NIV or the New Jerusalem Bible, they all say the same thing. There are some decisions the editors have taken mm -hmm. over and above what any scholars have said, because there's a, it's, you know, the thing about it's hatred politics is who is, but it's politics and theology. So it's, 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 I don't think it should be a special case, but the reality is who's producing this translation, and they may not want to admit that they don't know. <laughs> What's what, what, one, one last thing, I think I did two things intentionally. One is I used the word sufficiency quite sort of intentionally and sort of ironically. Um, yeah, you because I don't think... It seems like it's sufficient this view, only 10 out of 10. I, I, but I, 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 used, I used sufficient in a sense because I think it, I think it's, I hope that it exposes the fact that 
when you say sufficient, you must be asking for sufficient for what? And that's the reason I did the other thing, which is say from the very beginning, I'm going to have to speak as an historian because that's what moves me. So I struggle with that translation precisely with my historian's hat on. Yeah. But for other translations, for, for other uses, many of those other translations are just fine because they're going to speak to the ways in which communities, English-speaking communities, think and use words, and that's fine too. John, I want to speak to your headache. Mm. I think, can we take a couple more questions and then take it up? My own view is I have really been thrilled that we have two whole days without talking about testers' questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the only you fucked it up. <laughs> 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 Amen. <laughs> Sean and then Tony, I think. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was very, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed for your paper. And one of the points I particularly liked was, was early on, because you have lots and lots of detail in the kind of wide range of ground. And there was a slide you had early on with, kind of, I think, four main points, four different areas that you'd be looking at, which were raising issues that we could kind of take forward as, as a group. And particularly, I mean, that whole thorny issue of how we define uh, a text, and you spoke about different meanings of that. And I thought it was very fascinating the way you were looking at then a key aspect of that, the idea of different manuscript traditions to compare with uh, mm. manuscripts. And, uh, and I wonder if that's something you'd like to take forward in your own studies of Paul, looking at different manuscript traditions. Yeah, we should all be looking at the manuscripts much more. We depend too heavily on critical editions, I guess that they've become the text. But then again, it also still depends. With my historian's hat on, I ought to be looking at manuscripts. But when you receive this literature as a canon, which is transmitted and received and to be used in communities, it is actually quite appropriate to receive it in a form which can be agreed upon, and in a collection which can be agreed upon. And I think 1 Corinthians actually does mean different things when read in a canon than when you strip it out of the canon and try to put it back into the first century. The only dichotomy comes because the New Testament makes such empirical historical claims within it. There are so many moments where an author or the a New Testament text says, these things have happened, we have seen them. Um, I don't know. They call on witnesses, they call on witnesses. So you've got those, those profoundly historical contingent empirical claims made within the text. Whereas, in fact, what they do as an entire corpus is create a narrative, which is entirely legitimate because we all have narratives. Uh, so, the texts rather do call you to uh, think about events in time and space, and then they do call you to think about what the author actually meant. And they also resist it because they're a canon and they're producing this internal narrative which is more than any of the individual texts. So there is that tension, isn't there? We're going to end on a tension, I think. <laughs> <laughs>